Graham Young was born in Middlesex, England on September 7th, 1947. His mother died of tuberculosis just three months after his birth. His father, Fred, was therefore left to raise Graham and his older sister, Winnie Fred, by himself. But Fred was not up to the task, and so the young Graham was sent to live with his aunt, Winnie. The following year, Fred remarried, and Graham was sent back to live with him and his new stepmother, a rather unpleasant woman named Molly. While it is believed that Molly got along perfectly well with Graham's sister Winifred, she treated Graham with nothing but disdain. Following World War II, the Royal Air Force were rightly seen as heroes, and little boys all over Britain collected models of the airplanes that had saved their nation from the Nazi war machine. Graham had built up quite an impressive collection, but he was left devastated when Molly destroyed each and every one of his model aeroplanes after speaking back to her one day. By the time he was 12 years old, Graham Young was a disturbed young boy. His admiration for the RAF had given way to a love for all things Nazi, and he was determined to teach himself the German language. He had an almost encyclopedic knowledge of Adolf Hitler, and he was eventually suspended from school for wearing a swastika over his uniform. It was around this time that Graham first started to entertain the idea of hurting those who he felt had wronged him in some way. One day, he brought a voodoo doll into school, telling the other pupils that it was a caricature of his stepmother, Molly. Graham banged the doll against his desk, telling the other kids that he hoped to find the real Molly gravely injured when he got home from school. When Graham landed back at the house that evening, only to find Molly alive and well, he turned his back on black magic, as it clearly did not work. But Graham would soon find something much better than voodoo dolls to hurt people with, something that was grounded in scientific fact and not superstition and something that was as simple as making a cup of English tea. As he entered adolescence, Graham poured all of his energies into his studies and he was eventually accepted into a top grammar school. His father, Fred, was delighted. It appeared that his son had a great future ahead of him. Fred was seriously mistaken and his efforts to nurture his son's burgeoning interest in chemistry what backfire with lethal consequences. Fred purchased his son a chemistry set, but little did he know that he had just sparked a dangerous obsession in his teenage son. Graham's passion for chemistry would soon turn to something much darker, namely toxicology and the effects of poison upon the human body. Rather than reading about famous chemists such as Marie Curie or Antoine Lavoisier, Graham instead spent hours at the local library brushing up on famous poisoners such as Locusta, the former chief assassin for the Roman Emperor Nero, who had used a plant known as Deadly Nightshade to kill his employer's political enemies. Graham fantasized about eclipsing Locusta and earning his own place in history. In 1961, a 13-year-old Graham managed to get his hands on a chemical called antimony sodium tartrate. The pharmacist he procured the chemical from knew that it was highly toxic and he had been reluctant to give it to such a young boy. Graham had pleaded that he needed the chemical for an experiment with his chemistry set and not wanting to get in the way of a young scientist's education, the pharmacist had reluctantly given him a small sample. When Molly found the chemical in a small glass vial under her stepson's pillow, she threw it out and warned the pharmacist not to sell Graham anything else. Graham was furious, but he was easily able to acquire antimony from a different pharmacist, and this time he was extra careful when hiding his sample. Graham began to set traps for small animals and he would rush home from school every day to see what he had killed. The whole thing was one big rush for Graham. 
at first anyway. Eventually though, Graham did not get the same buzz he once had from killing birds and small rodents. He was ready to up the stakes and experiment with a human being. Christopher Williams was the only real friend Graham Young had. Like Graham, Christopher had a keen interest in chemistry. The two boys often ate their lunch together in the school canteen. One day, Graham laced his own sandwich with antimony. He then suggested that he and Christopher swap lunches, which was something they had done before on occasion. Christopher agreed, and shortly after lunch, he began to vomit uncontrollably. He also complained of a blinding headache, telling a teacher that he thought his head was going to explode. Rather than feeling any remorse for the agony that he had put his one true friend through, Graham Young was absolutely ecstatic. That night, he recorded Christopher's symptoms in a perverse lab book that he kept in his bedroom. Doctors had no clue just what was wrong with Christopher. The idea that the lad had been poisoned hadn't even crossed their minds. Christopher was kept in bed at home with the hope that his condition would improve with time. During this period, no visitors were allowed inside the Williams household. The boy was carrying something that might be infectious. Graham was despondent as he was no longer able to make any observations of his nefarious experiment. He knew that the next time he poisoned somebody, he was going to have to strike a lot closer to home. One morning, Graham got up early and made the whole family cups of tea. While his 22 year old sister got ready for work, Graham dissolved 50 milligrams of a chemical called atropine into her tea. His heart skipped a beat when Winifred took a gulp and remarked, I think the milk must be off. This tastes horrible. Winifred tossed her tea down the sink and set off for work. She told her younger brother not to worry about the tea and said that she appreciated the gesture. Winifred boarded a train as part of her morning travel routine and by the time she arrived at her stop she was feeling faint and having hallucinations. She managed to make it to her place of work but her colleagues took one look at her and told her to get to a hospital immediately. In the end an ambulance had to be sent for as Winifred started complaining of chest pains. At the hospital, doctors immediately realized that Winifred had been poisoned. They were confident that she had somehow ingested a plant known as Phoenus Passion. Fred Graham was suspicious though. He knew that his son had been mucking around with chemicals, as he put it, and Molly reminded him of the incident with the pharmacist and the antimony. Fred was convinced that Graham had poisoned his sister, though willingly or accidentally, he could not yet say. When Fred confronted his son, Graham remarked that his sister often used the house cups to mix shampoos and she probably hadn't cleaned out a cup and thus accidentally poisoned herself. This satisfied Fred, but he still insisted that his son get rid of all the chemicals in his chemistry set just as an extra precaution. Graham begrudgingly agreed. Despite the suspicion that he had aroused by poisoning his own sister, Graham Young could not wait to strike again. He had always despised his stepmother, Molly, and so she was a logical choice for his next experiment. Over a period of time, Graham began to sprinkle Molly's food with tiny doses of antimony. The doses were exceptionally small, but they were still enough to provoke symptoms such as vomiting and diarrhea. As time went by, Molly lost all of her hair and she could hardly stand up due to agonizing back pain. Upon being hospitalized, doctors correctly misdiagnosed Molly as suffering from a stomach ulcer. When Molly quickly recovered from her sickness while in the hospital, she was sent home and doctors were confident that she was now cured. Weeks went by and still Molly felt absolutely fine, but little did she know that her stepson was biding his time. Like a coiled up snake, Graham was just waiting for the right moment to strike again. Of all the poisons that Graham Young would use, 
There was only one that ever truly captured his heart, thallium. Thallium is a highly soluble metal that easily dissolves in water and is lethal at even minute doses. It has no odor and no taste. With these characteristics, it is easy to see why thallium would become Graham Young's go-to poison. On Easter Sunday, 1962, 14-year-old Graham doused his mother's dinner with 1.3 grams of thallium. The following day, Molly woke up feeling a little bit chilly, but did not think much of it as it was a cold morning. Come the afternoon, she was struggling to breathe. Molly rushed out to the backyard in a desperate attempt to get some air into her lungs. She then collapsed to the ground, gasping for help. Fred found his wife a few minutes later. He realized that whatever had been afflicting his wife before was now back and it appeared to be even worse this time. Fred got his wife to the hospital, but there was nothing doctors could do. Molly was dead less than an hour after her arrival. Graham Young was now a murderer. Molly's death was bizarrely attributed to a dislocated bone at the top of her spine. Molly had been in a car accident the year before and it was believed that this minor injury had somehow turned fatal. Graham Young was in the clear. A few days later, Graham attended his stepmother's funeral. After the ceremony, Molly's friends and family went to the local pub for a few drinks. Graham quickly grew bored and so, to entertain himself, he slipped some thallium into his uncle's teacup and watched with sheer joy as the man buckled over and started to vomit. With the stepmother he had always hated finally gone, Graham soon turned his attention to his father. The two had never been particularly close, but there certainly was not any animosity between them. Graham Young was a thoroughbred psychopath though. He didn't care about anybody but himself. Graham began lacing his father's food with microdoses of antimony. His father began to suffer regular bouts of vomiting, but he blamed his ailments on grief, not making the connection between his own symptoms and those of his now deceased wife. Eventually, Fred was hospitalized. One day, Graham went to visit him. Graham's visit had nothing to do with any concern on his part for his father. He was simply there to gather results for his lab book. By now, doctors had ascertained that Fred Graham had been poisoned, but they were not sure what poison had been used. It was suspected that either arsenic or antimony was to blame. At this point, Graham gave a mini lecture on the similarities and differences between arsenic and antimony poisoning. As the boy continued to speak intelligently and competently about poisons, it suddenly dawned on everybody in the room that 15 year old Graham Young had been poisoning his own father and Fred was now certain that Graham had not only been responsible for poisoning Winifred all along but that he had also murdered his wife Molly. Keep him the hell away from me, Fred shouted at the doctors. The police were called and Graham was arrested. He admitted that he had indeed poisoned his family and in 1962, he was sent to Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. He was to serve at the very least 15 years and could not be released without authorization from the Home Secretary. Graham would stay at Broadmoor for seven years. The parole panel who interviewed him before his release agreed that his actions had been those of a confused adolescent and nothing more than a phase that he had now grown out of. The psychiatrists at Broadmoor deemed Graham Young to pose a trivial risk to the public and was at a low risk of reoffending. They were wrong. Fred Graham made it clear that he had burned all bridges with his son and Graham was no longer welcome in his home. Winnie Fred had by now got married and started a family of her own. She took pity on her younger brother and agreed that he could stay with her, her husband and their child. At first, Graham seemed to adjust well to life outside of Broadmoor. In the spring of 1971, he secured a job at the camera manufacturer Hadland 
and he made a good first impression. As part of his duties, Graham was expected to deliver a cup of tea twice a day to his colleagues. For a monster like Graham Young, it was only a matter of time before he gave in to temptation. After finding his own accommodation, Graham realised that he could keep a lab book documenting his human experiments, just as he had done when he was a teenager, without having to worry about his sister or anybody else finding it. Bob Eagle was Graham's boss at Hadland. While Hadland's monitors knew that Graham had spent some time in Broadmoor, they had no idea that he had been there for poisoning his family or killing his own stepmother for that matter. Bob had written a glowing review about Graham for his probation officer, something that Graham was well aware of. Bob's reward for giving Graham a good appraisal was to have his cup of tea spiked with antimony. Bob went home sick from work and returned a few days later when he felt better. However, Graham poisoned him again and this cycle of feeling ill and getting better would continue until eventually Bob was hospitalised. Graham paid his boss a visit every evening after work. He played the part of the concerned employee well and Bob was grateful for his visits. Of course, Graham was simply visiting his boss so that he could observe his symptoms and record them in his lab manual. On July 7th, 1971, Bob Eagle lost his fight and his heart finally gave in. Graham was standing just a few feet away as doctors tried desperately to resuscitate Bob. Graham Young had now killed for a second time. Following Bob's death, his position at Hadland became available. There were more than a few eyebrows raised when the inexperienced Graham successfully applied for the role. Graham no longer had to worry about other people in his department bossing him around. He was the boss. He was the one who gave the orders, just like his favourite Nazi figures, who he still idolised so much. Getting away with Bob Eagle's murder and then taking his job had emboldened Graham. He felt unstoppable. One day during a tea break, a man named Fred Biggs approached Graham for some advice. The man was having problems with insects in his garden. Graham saw a chance to show off. He gave Fred a list of poisons that would easily solve his problem, but he was left furious when Fred said that he didn't like the idea of spreading poison all over his garden. Just like that, Graham had found a new target. Roughly two months after Bob Eagle's demise, Fred Biggs suddenly came down with symptoms that were eerily similar to those of his erstwhile employer. While there might have been some twisted logic to Graham's decision to target Fred Biggs, after this, he embarked on a mass poisoning campaign that was purely random in nature. In September of 1971, Graham made a cup of tea for Hadland's accounts manager. The man became ill almost immediately and was forced to take the rest of the week off work. As he didn't come into further contact with Graham upon his return to Hadland, the monitor made a full recovery and his symptoms never returned. By now, Graham was completely out of control. He now exclusively used thallium out of both practicality and curiosity. A clerk by the name of David Tilson was Graham's next target. He only took a few sips of the tea which Graham served him, as he had been suffering from acid reflux that morning. And it was this innocuous health ailment that had saved his life. If David had drunk even half of the tea Graham had served him that morning, he would have been dead within 48 hours. But despite only consuming a minuscule amount of the thallium laced tea, David was still struck down with agonizing ailments. He awoke in the middle of the night with a blinding headache, pins and needles in his legs that made it almost impossible to stand up, and his vision was blurred. He was forced to drag himself down his stairs to call an ambulance. Doctors were baffled by David's symptoms. With David still recovering from his mystery illness, a clerk by the name of Jethro Bat stepped in to help Graham with the backlog of work that had piled up. For some reason, Graham made no attempt to hide his obsession with Nazism from Jethro, 
As the two men worked, Graham would try to impress Jethro with his encyclopedic knowledge of Nazism's key figures. Jethro had lost several family members in World War II and he was not impressed by Graham's admiration for the regime that had taken their lives. One day he had finally had enough. He told Graham that if he liked Nazi Germany so much then maybe he should F off to Germany and hope that they start the Reich up again someday. Graham was furious. As a narcissist he simply could not tolerate personal insults. Naturally Jethro became Graham's next target. Graham was so insulted that he decided to poison Jethro the very same day. He offered to make him a cup of coffee, which Jethro took to be Graham's way of apologising. Jethro was not a big coffee drinker, but he didn't want to refuse what he wrongfully thought was an apology, and so he thanked Graham for his courtesy. However, when Jethro took a sip of the coffee, he was immediately repulsed by it. It wasn't that he could detect the thallium, it was simply too strong for his liking. Jethro excused himself and disposed of the coffee in the canteen. He waited for a few minutes before returning to the room where he and Graham were working so as to give the impression that he had drank all of the coffee. This undoubtedly saved Jethro's life. Graham had been so annoyed with Jethro's insult that he had loaded the coffee cup with enough volume to kill 10 men. But the single sip that Jethro had ingested was still more than enough to bring about awful symptoms. That afternoon he started to vomit constantly and was having strange visions. In one vision, Jethro saw Graham standing on a podium in full Nazi regalia, shouting in German while the Hadland workers stood below him, trembling in fear. Perhaps Jethro's subconscious suspected that there was something sinister about Hadland's supposedly star employee. Graham's next target was a woman named Diana Smart. For some reason, Graham resorted back to using antimony when it came to poisoning Diana. She became sick one day and took the rest of the week off. Upon her return to Hadland, she once more felt ill and took some time off before recovering almost immediately. This pattern continued for several months and it was becoming crystal clear that there was obviously something at Hadland that was making people ill. Residents in the local town of Bovingdon were also aware that something just wasn't right at the camera plant. The local press dubbed the rash of mysterious illnesses the Bovingdon Bug but all of the illnesses stemmed from just one place, the Hadland Camera Factory. Diana Smart was sure that she knew the reason behind her and her colleagues' sickness. Diana Smart was sure that she knew the reason behind her and her numerous colleagues' sickness. It was because of Graham Young. Diana had noticed that Graham had always been a picture of health during his time at Hadland. Despite the fact that he had been in close proximity to each and every worker who had fallen ill right before their symptoms started. However, Diana did not believe for a second that Graham was somehow purposefully infecting his colleagues. She suspected that he carried some sort of virus, one that he was unwillingly spreading around Hadland, but which he himself was immune to. Diana shared her theory with other workers, most of whom thought that there was some merit to what Diana was saying. Graham was aware of the gossip in Hadland, that he was somehow the source of the so-called Bovingdon bug, but even then he could not rein in his so-called experiments. For some reason, he turned his attention back to Fred Biggs, who was one of his first targets at Hadland. The same day he was informed that a rumour was spreading that he might be carrying a virus that was behind the spate of illnesses. Graham served Fred several cups of tea. Each and every one of them was laced with thallium. The next day Fred was admitted to hospital with chest pains and a vast array of other symptoms including alopecia. While Fred Biggs was fighting for his life in hospital Hadland was subjected to a surprise inspection from health officials. 
When the inspectors packed up to leave for the day, they declared that Hadland was a perfectly safe place to work. Less than one hour later, Fred Biggs was dead. During his last hours of life, Fred's skin had started to peel off. Grief swept over Hadland once more as a second employee had lost his life to the Bovingdon bug. That grief was soon replaced by anger. It was undeniable that something was terribly amiss at the factory and many staff members walked out and said that they would not return until the source of the illness was positively identified and eradicated. The next day, Hadland called in their company physician to reassure the employees. Dr. Ian Anderson spoke to the employees at length. In the short time that he was there, he politely refused Graham Young's offer of a cup of tea on no fewer than five occasions. Dr. Anderson told the employees that he was confident in the results of the recent inspection and that the factory was safe to work in. The employees were incredulous. How could anybody seriously believe that Hadland was a safe working environment? When he was done talking, Dr. Anderson held a Q&A session. Graham couldn't help himself. It was driving him nuts that the other workers were looking at Dr. Anderson as if he was the smartest man in the room. Graham couldn't have that. He needed to show everybody that he was the intellectual equivalent, if not superior, of the man standing before them. Graham raised his hand and asked if the good doctor had considered the possibility that the two deaths and numerous sicknesses were the result of heavy metal ingestion. The doctor shook his head. He was dumbfounded. Graham pointed out that alopecia, a symptom that numerous Bovingdon bug victims had suffered, was consistent with thallium poisoning. Some Hadland employees shot suspicious glances in Graham's direction, and Dr. Anderson's own suspicions were raised. Just how did a store clerk know so much about toxins and poisons? Afterwards, Dr. Anderson asked to speak with Graham alone. He said he was curious about Graham's theory. Graham, once more, could not help showing off. He started speaking at length about a whole array of poisons and their effects on the human body. Dr. Anderson nodded along as Graham spoke, doing his best to appear calm. In reality, the doctor's pulse was racing. It was obvious to him that he was speaking with the man who had been behind the Bovingdon bug all along. It was clear now that the victims had indeed been poisoned, and the man standing before him was the culprit. Upon leaving Hadland, Dr. Anderson went straight to the police station. There, he told detectives that there was a worker at Hadland who should be investigated immediately as a suspect in the illnesses that had been plaguing the company for almost a year. Detective John Kirkpatrick had his doubts, but he agreed to look into Graham Young anyway. When he noticed that the Bovingdon bug's arrival coincided with Graham Young beginning his employment at Hadland, he thought that Dr. Anderson might just be on to something. Kirkpatrick contacted Scotland Yard and asked for a copy of Graham Young's criminal record. The detective discovered that Graham had served time at the infamous Broadmoor and he wanted to know just what it was that had landed the young Graham a stint there. When Kirkpatrick was informed that Graham Young had served time for poisoning his whole family with a heavy metal, everything clicked into place. 24 year old Graham Young was making himself a sandwich when the police came to arrest him. At the station he acted dumb. He claimed that a virus had taken the lives of Bob Eagle and Fred Biggs. Well if that's what you think then why did you tell Dr. Anderson yesterday that you were sure they had been poisoned with thallium? Kirkpatrick asked him. Graham knew then he had made the same mistake he had in the immediate aftermath of poisoning his own father. By not being able to keep his mouth shut and bragging about his knowledge of poisons, Graham had dug his own grave once more. While detectives interviewed Graham relentlessly, officers searched the room he was renting. There, they found a huge supply of toxins, namely antimony and thallium, but they still did not have enough to secure a conviction. The evidence against Graham 
was entirely circumstantial. That was until a police officer discovered Graham's lab book. The book offered highly detailed descriptions of the poisonings he had carried out at Hadland, including who was poisoned, with which toxin and how much. He also kept an accurate record of the symptoms which his poisons had produced in each individual. The lab book was a smoking gun. Graham didn't have a leg to stand on. Despite the damning evidence against him, Graham pleaded not guilty when his trial commenced on June 19th, 1972. The prosecution immediately asked him to explain the lab book. Graham tried to claim that it was in fact a fictional novel he had been working on, one inspired by the case of the Bovingdon Bug. By now, an autopsy had been performed on Fred Biggs. His family gave permission for the body to be exhumed, as they were sure that Graham had indeed killed him. The autopsy revealed that thallium was present throughout every one of his major organs. Despite the fact that Bob Eagle had been cremated, a chemical analysis of his ashes also showed phenomenally high levels of thallium. This was the first time in British legal history that a person's ashes had been used as evidence in a murder case. To avoid prejudice, the jury could not be told of Graham's prior conviction for poisoning his family when he was a teenager, but the jury had all the evidence they needed. It took them just over one hour to find Graham guilty of the murder of Bob Eagle and Fred Biggs, the attempted murder of Jethro Butt and David Tilson, and he was also found guilty of grievous bodily harm for the poisoning of Diana Smart and Ronald Hewitt. Graham's biggest fear was returning to Broadmoor. He requested that he be allowed to serve his life sentence in a normal prison. The request was granted and Graham was sent to prison Park Lane. While in prison, Graham befriended the notorious Moorish murderer Ian Brady. Brady and his girlfriend had murdered several children in Manchester in the 1970s and disposed of their bodies on Saddleworth Moor. Like Graham, Brady was fascinated by Nazism. Brady would later say of Graham Young, I don't know what that guy's gig was. I killed to get back at God, but I think Graham killed because he wanted to be God. In prison, Graham was something of a mini celebrity. He reveled in the notoriety, but he was essentially an outcast. Staff and prisoners alike shunned him. When he passed away at the untimely age of 43 from a heart attack, rumours ran abound that he had been murdered by the other prisoners, many of whom were terrified of him. It has been suggested that Graham's constant lecturing about how to make poisons might have given them the knowledge to carry out the deed.